get started. Um, first off, uh, huge shout out to all the incredible people that make Denver Startup Week possible. Um, this is crazy, uh, the amount of work that goes on, the amount of sessions that happen like this, the amount of hours that get put into putting this on, and all the incredible spent sponsors. I need to very specifically thank Quizlet because they're putting on the developer track, but all of the sponsors are immensely appreciated. Denver Startup Week is a true uh, value add to our community and to Denver and uh, you know, massive appreciation to all of them. Um, yep, yeah, sponsors, they're good. We appreciate them. Uh, we'll, we'll keep running. Um, oh my God, look at how much people care about Denver Startup Week. That's great. So uh, my name is Carter Schultz. I am the robotics architect at Amp Robotics. Um, I'm responsible for making stuff move around in the real world. Um, I'm joined by the wonderful Joe Castagnieri. Hello, I'm Joe. I, I lead AI at uh, Amp Robotics as well. Carter and I have worked together for the last several years. Uh, my team is building the perception algorithms that see the trash and then uh, teams Carter leads and works with are taking those perceptions and, and making real action in the real world with them. So both of us have been kind of inculcated in startups for uh, many years at this point and uh, earned a couple of battle scars, but mostly just liked the technology on the way. And so we're here to tell you about the beautiful marriage between perception and robotics and talk about robotics in the real world. Sweet. Uh, what's the title of our talk? We're talking about robots, we're talking about AI, we're talking about how those come together to sort of unlock new technology and unlock new growth in an in industry. Um, this talks at pretty high level and pretty vague when we're really trying to talk about what are the fundamental changes happening to produce what people call like the fourth industrial revolution. How are brand new technologies meeting old technologies to deliver more value? Uh, we're gonna start with kind of like the classic, what's a robot? What is a robot to all of you guys? And I'm gonna make you do actual like mental exercise, close your eyes, picture what do you think a robot is? You got it, you can do this. Some of you, maybe you're thinking a little Jetsonsy. You're thinking about Rosie. She flies around, she takes care of things for you. She recognizes problems in the world around them and just like a person does, solves them. That's a great vision of a robot. That's what we dream robots are gonna be and you know, all of this is building towards. Not everyone's gonna think about that. Here's what Rosie is today. Here's the best we've been able to accomplish with literally billions of man hours of R&D standing on a pinnacle of technology. We get a little vacuum that drives around. We're getting close guys, right? It's coming together. And if you're slightly more cynical than that even, maybe that's what you think about. And you're seeing videos online of, of you know, robot dogs with guns strapped on their back and, <laughs> Oh, let's let's not have robots being that. But you know, fundamentally, let's get to the definition. What is a robot? Ah. Uh. Robots are everywhere. They are ubiquitous in the world today and they are systems that make our lives easier through any kind of automation. Um, robots don't look like the Jetsons. They don't need to. They don't look like the things that people typically picture when they think about robots. Thousands of things you interact with every day are already robots, from the hard drive in your computer, to the uh, cruise control in your car, to the elevator you rode in on the way here. So uh, we'll actually dive into the textbook definition of a robot. Oh, I have to look at the picture first. I should, I should pay well, attention. Yeah, we can explain slide. some of these too. Yeah. Um, other examples of the crazy things that are still robots out there. Probably the most terrifying one, the stock market. <laughs> People don't think of that as robots, but most of the trading volume that happens in the world today is done through automated algorithms that are sensing the world around them, thinking about what's happening and making trade decisions that affect real world financial dollars. Um, over time, the airplanes that we fly in get more and more and more automated, and in doing so, they get safer and more reliable and more predictable. Uh, it, everybody thinks traditional industrial automation, that's out there, that exists, it's continuing to grow, but it's not growing in the ways that most people expect. It's not growing in these arms, getting faster, getting more powerful, doing more crazy things. It's getting it's growing in these arms doing things they could not do before. Fundamentally more complex, more crazy actions. And then in the center, we'll, we'll show this more later, but that's AMP's technology now. Those are our robots in trash factories uh, doing a pretty crazy thing. So fundamental definition, I kind of I kind of let this slip in the words I've already been saying, a robot is a simple system. It has to do three fundamental things. It has to be able to sense the world around it, reason about 
the things that it sensed, and then act in the real world. Any system which does those three things, we would call a robot. Um, all of these things have been getting way better in the last 20 years. Sensors are go going higher resolution. Sensors are getting into new spectra, new wavelengths, measuring polarity, measuring things that weren't possible to be measured before, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, some people say Moore's Law is dead. Moore's Law is dead in some places, yet certain types of technology are getting able to think much, much faster, much, much more broadly. And then the real world action side, Hopefully you guys have seen the Boston Dynamics videos. Not everything is getting better, but holy crap, are there some incredible actuations out there where, where we're just like hydraulic actuators are getting so good now. And uh, all, all of those are coming together to continue the momentum of the Industrial Revolution. So specifically now, I think we're going to talk about AI. Are we going to talk about AI? Yeah, getting into uh, robotics in the industry the old school of robotics and this new school of robotics that is emerging. And I think if you walk away from today with a thesis, it's that robotics, robots in the real world, they don't look like humans. They're actually all around you and they're doing things for you in everyday life and will continue to do that more and more. So there's this massive emerging confluence of technology. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, where those things are. You're given a couple high level examples. But uh, we've got our planes and our assembly line here again. Let's talk about the history of robotics. Everybody has kind of thought about the assembly line where you have a robot arm, you know, pick up a car door and pivot it over from point A to point B, repetitive motion, input and output. Going back to that definition, what are we sensing? Well, really, I'm sensing an electrical signal of when the plant tells me the car is here so I can go over here and I have maybe a signal that I've successfully picked up the door, so I'm clear to move. And then I'm going to put it against the car. I have a signal that it is actually joined to the car, and I'm going to do, it, do that again. So the input we're measuring is pretty programmatic, controlled electrical signal. And what we're doing, the system is just going to do motion, pretty simple motion that we can program directly. And then the real world outcome is that we don't have to build cars ourselves anymore, and that's, that's pretty nice. For a plane, like a, it's a little bit more complicated of a system. So let's let's talk about some of the inputs there. I mean, you got yaw, pitch, roll, maybe GPS, velocity of the plane. More complicated, but still, I can count them out on a couple of hands. And we might say, okay, well, I have this trajectory I want to be on. What corrective action, what thrust do I have to, to add to the trajectory of this plane to correct? so that I'm back on my trajectory. So do a small correction to make sure that I'm still on the route that I want to go on. So in that case, you know, we have these uh, measurements that are kind of physical in nature. We're making a small incremental change in, a, in measuring again. And the real world outcome is that pilots barely fly planes anymore. Something in common amongst both of those examples is the input space is actually pretty simple. Like we're telling the robot what to do or we're sensing pretty basic things. We're sensing things that we can sense with tools that have existed in engineering and technology for many decades. Uh, that is robotics kind of as it has existed until let's say circa 2015. If we go into now, a couple of things have changed. There's been some technological innovations that now allow that simplicity of inputs to a robotic system to be way, way more complicated. And let's start by talking about the compute. So what we have here, and to Carter's comment on Moore's Law, Moore's Law is just this statement that we're going to exponentially increase the amount of computational power available. And we're starting to come up against quantum mechanical limits on how much more we can do that for things like CPUs. But there are other types of chips where this law is still in effect. The GPU, the graphics processing unit, is something that's really good at doing matrix math. And it is used to render graphics traditionally. But it can also be used to do math. And this curve you can see down here is looking at, uh, across time, how much compute can we do with GPUs? These little curves down here, these are actually CPUs uh, or integrated GPU CPU cards. The, I mean, look at the big curve, the big exponential curve. That's the one that we as uh, ro applicational robotics people are writing. Like we are looking at this exponential increase in compute. Now, why does this matter? Well, if you have exponentially more compute than you did 10 years ago, 
you can do exponentially more complicated math with it on the edge, right? So instead of having these robotic systems that take in very simple inputs, we don't want to give them simple inputs. We've just been compute limited, right? If we're no longer compute limited, let's let's give them way more complex inputs to process, and all of a sudden we can do far more complicated uh, processing of far more complicated input data. Instead of moving a car door onto the car, we can do things like teach robots how to see and sort recycling, which you'll hear about in a bit. The second thing that followed this, so you, okay, you have compute availability and then you get all the math people like me coming in and trying to make algorithms that take advantage of that compute. So you might have heard of deep learning AI, and it's obviously a really big buzzword, but it is taking advantage of all of that exponential increase in compute to run far more complicated algorithms. Um, this is another, I made another graph for you guys, I stole another graph, exponential graph, um, talking about how complicated models are over time. And it goes back to 1954. Uh, in the before times, we've been, you know, processing camera feeds, videos for a long time. And what you would do is as an engineer, you'd be like, is it green? Does it look round? And I might think of five things that I can write code to detect. Is there a square in this? and combine those observations together to make some sort of decision, you can see how that might be pretty brittle. For our application, we're sorting, you know, like aluminum cans. If I look for something that the 2D projection is a rectangle, it's a cylinder rectangle, right? What if it's crushed? Suddenly my algorithm's not gonna work. The problem with these old style algorithms is they just don't really have that many input features. There aren't that many parameters in the model. They're not very complicated models. And they couldn't be because there wasn't compute to run them on. But here you can see, you know, in 1954, computer vision algorithms had like, you know, 50 different parameters in them. Nowadays, they literally have a billion. So instead of, is it green? Is, is there a circle in this image? That being two, there are a billion in, in the models that run today. Our model that we run on the edge in all of our robots, it has a hundred million parameters and is running at live speeds. So you can imagine the amount of computation that that requires, right? So at the top here, you can see kind of, you know, a, a visual rendering of what some of these neural networks look like. Just a lot of different processing steps going through where a very complex architecture is ultimately processing this input data. So now that we kind of have some context, Let's talk about the result. I mean, what does this really mean? You can just process on really complicated inputs. Uh, in our application, we're processing on video, which has just a lot of data on it. And if you can process really complex algorithms on really dense video, you can now do tasks that before now were just tasks that were really boring for a human to do, but are now achievable by a robot. I'll add in here, you know, you talk about 100 million parameters in a model. Let's say you pay a developer to write every single one of those coefficients. How much does Microsoft pay per line of code that a developer actually writes? They estimate that a developer writes about 100 lines of code a month if they're doing a really good job. That would be so much R&D money. And so the second like major unlock that comes with a lot of this is the fact that we can generate models that complex without someone physically going in and being like, oh, what happens if I turn this knob up? What happens if I turn that knob now? We can now do that at industrial scale. So, it, you know, we unlocked a billion times more compute. How do we write a billion times more complex code without paying software developers? Nobody wants to pay software developers. <laughs> I think that's a really good point because these hundred million parameters, I'm not setting. I think that's maybe the spookiest thing of this whole thing. They set themselves, right? It's the only way it could scale. Um, so this uh, that you can see right here, just to give you an example of the flexibility that this unlocks, like in the, in the before times when I write my handwritten algorithm that sees five things, I might be able to see five things. Uh, we, uh, with our systems, are able to detect a really massive array of different types of recycling. And it's pretty a natural, it's a natural process to add support for more. You just get more data and you train the model and that additional data that you have explained what is what in that, in that image. And so you can see how flexible this type of system is. And this is a really big deal to industry because historically, I mean, any industrial process is 
very specific because it has to be efficient. You have heavy equipment that might be part of some industrial process, it does one thing. And if market conditions change, it does one thing. So one thing that is coming to and is here in industrial process systems and that we're supplying with, uh, with our company at Robotics is flexibility at industrial scale, which is something that just frankly hasn't existed. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the, you know, the factory owner, the factory runner, how would you design something, a factory, if you had reconfigurable industrial equipment that can do new things over time? It completely changes the equation. To, to bring in a sort of concrete example here, there are new packaging manufacturers creating new types of materials every single day. Traditional recycling sorting equipment that was designed 30 years ago never realized that this particular composite material combining these three layers was going to enter the market 15 years from now. But suddenly, a vision system, if you can look at it and you can tell what it is by just looking at it, we can adapt to that and over the air push an update to these systems that enable them now sort a material that they couldn't before. Um, so the flexibility manifests really concretely in the recycling application in particular. And this is kind of where I'll hand back off to Carter because everything I've talked about is my my love, the perception side. Uh, the other benefit of this though is that now you can see it, well robots are pretty fast and they don't need to take breaks and they don't get sick. So like you can see here, like a human sorting recycling will sort at 40 picks per minute and they'll generally average tenure at a recycling facilities about three and a half weeks before you have to replace that person because the job is dull, dirty, and dangerous. But our robots can almost quadruple that, right? Uh, they can see honestly more accurately than a human can uh, because tell me what this resin type is, please. Here's the quiz. Um, and they can move at three Gs. So uh, handing back off to Carter, he'll tell you a bit about Amp Robotics and how we have kind of implemented this type of technology in a real industry. My, minor correction, they move at 10 Gs, um, 120 picks per minute. The, the, the most important thing I sort of want to drill here about the robotics side of this is that Amp is not a revolutionary robotics company. We are using completely off the shelf components. All of this is industrial standard and that's why it works. One of the like best tips I can give uh, a starting uh, robotics company out there is do the least amount of things you possibly can and simplify the problem for yourself as much as possible. On the robotics side here, we are technology integrators above and above anything else. Our job is to find the right magic smoke that people have already put in the right devices and just get them to plug into each other and hope it works and yay, we got it right. So uh, what, uh, deep dive, who is AMP? Uh, we are making recycling sorting robots uh, economical. We are fundamentally lowering the cost of recycling around the world by providing a low cost vision system, a low cost robot that can reliably be put to a facility and day after day after day sort and every day it's getting better because every day the compute is getting better, the neural net is getting better, and the fundamental technology keeps improving in a way that was impossible to imagine literally 10 years ago. Like This is the cutting edge of what's possible in industrial automation. Um, Joe can talk more about where we're going. Yes, so we look out at all of the recycling infrastructure that exists today and we see that it's 20 to 30 years out of date. It's fundamentally not flexible and they're really exposed to high cost issues. And so there's a ripe opportunity there to apply existing technology to existing processes and make them fundamentally different. So when we think back to that plant operator, if they have fundamentally more flexible technology and fundamentally more flexible, more intelligent infrastructure, what emergent market can you kind of build out of that? We can suddenly um, be the, uh, the providers of materials that historically have not been recyclable and now are because we can see them at, at that level. So a little bit of history for you. Uh, Amp Robotics was started in 2014 by Dr. Matanya Horowitz. He had just gotten a little bit bored finishing up his 12-dimensional robotic controls PhD at Caltech. And so he started Amp Robotics as a, as, you know, a project. And uh, we were non-dilutively funded for a couple of years before securing uh, a few rounds of uh, more classical VC funding from some of these partners that you can see below. Uh, we've grown from that you know, obviously tiny startup to now about 300 people. We are multi-continental. We have a sales team in Europe starting to sell into European markets. 
And uh, our kind of two lines of business are one, building robots that we sell to existing recycling operators and they put them in their plants and use it as a way to improve their own margins, right? They're costing down and getting more revenue by higher quality sortation. We also build our own uh, sites. We build our own facilities where we uh, install robotics across the swath and uh, operate it at our own profit. So moving along, uh, our kind of stats right now, uh, as we're starting to, you know, we're hopefully continuing on our hockey stick trajectory here. Uh, we've got about 300 robots in the field um, in about 80 different facilities, some of them owned by us, but most of them not. And uh, I like this statistic annually right now with that deployed fleet, we actually see 50 billion objects a year because uh, that's how much trash there is. The scope of it kind of runs away from you sometimes. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how it works. Yeah, and again, uh, we defined a robot at the very beginning. This is uh, a robot. It's as simple as this. There's a basic RGB camera sensor that you've been able to buy off the shelf for 20 years. Um, nothing novel in that area for us. It's great. Makes it easy to develop. Makes it easy to buy. Makes the supply chain not blow up suddenly if something goes wrong in the world. We combine that with the true unlocking technology here, which is fundamentally better compute, fundamentally better decision making unlocked by um, particularly GPUs. Uh, like we are riding the wave of NVIDIA um, and they are making incredible compute capability available at incredibly low prices. Um, for perspective here, the compute that we run in the box with the robot at the customer site is on the order of a million times more powerful than a traditional industrial robot. The industrial robot that we buy off the shelf comes with a processor on it that is a dual core processor at 1.1 gigahertz and we can literally do a million times more math than it um, on, our, on our vision compute platform. But that's what it's take, taken to unlock the value in these video feeds. Um, finally, it's again, it's, it is a completely standard off the shelf industrial Delta style pick and place robot that has gone through 40 years of R&D in existing industrial applications uh, that makes it so that we were able to put this in an incredibly harsh, incredibly chaotic environment and have 99% uptime from day one that is just unheard of in, in novel um, R&D environments. The last thing that's just always important to talk about here is that another major enabling technology that made all of this possible is the storage of that data as the system is operating. Our systems are some of the first always online, always connected, always receiving software updates to go into these style of facilities. We talk to our customers and we say, hey, if you wanna buy our robots, you have to sign a contract that you give us an internet connection because our technology relies on that to work, both to be able to collect the data that then feeds back to make the system better and then to deliver continuous value to our customers by bringing that down. But if you went to an existing manufacturer 20 years ago and said, hey, I'm gonna put something in your facility and I'm gonna connect to it remotely over the internet, they would have shot you. <laughs> like, that wasn't gonna happen. So. Uh, at the high level, that's that's the amazing stuff put together. Now, here's, I think, the, the, the sexy part. This is what it looks like in an actual facility. These are what these facilities look like. These are how gross they are. And these are some of our cells that run every day sorting thousands and thousands and thousands of objects 24-7, tons per hour. Um, traditional applications that our, our robots see in these facilities is a lot on quality control lines. The existing template for these facilities that was kind of built out in the 80s was to have a few huge pieces of, uh, of industrial equipment sort to you know terrible purities. They sort to 60% purity, 70% purity. And then you would have 30, 40, 60, 100 human sorters on lines manually sorting that material up to high enough grade. We are a direct drop in replacement for that human sorting. Now, uh, I can personally feel bad, like nobody likes robots taking our jobs, but I, I feel okay because I can also say, hey, in like Star Trek universe, world was perfect. Should anybody have to stand there and sort trash Absolutely not. And the largest problem that these facilities have faced over the last decade has been being able to find a workforce at 
all that is willing to operate in those environments and willing to do this job. Um, so uh, it all came together. It came together kind of magically. Um, AMP got very lucky and found at the right time this inflection point where AI technology was on an upward exponential curve that we could hop on that bandwagon. We found the right market where, hey, look, here is a vision problem that off-the-shelf AI models that Google is developing for us can be applied with the right AI integration to the right robot to actually sort something super effectively. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it's worked out great. So uh, you should do the same thing. Figure it out. Uh, Con concluding remark is, uh, let's return to that question. What is the fourth industrial revolution? Well, if you can have robotic systems that can fundamentally consume far more complex data, data that's more complex by three orders of magnitude than what you've done before. You can apply that in a fundamentally more flexible way in every industry. So here's an example of one industry. This is recycling. We can fundamentally change the economics of recycling to make it a uh, cost improved version of landfilling uh, where we're not throwing away value, we're sorting instead. But you better believe there's a need for it, and there is action happening in every other industry in the world right now uh, with exactly these systems. So a robot isn't, isn't the Jetsons. A robot is fundamental infrastructure, and it's surrounding everything that you do, and it's empowering our everyday lives. So next time uh, you're thinking about robotics, you know, uh, think about the power grid and think about AMP. Yeah, uh, questions? Yeah. What's the theory, and what's your revenue? What's the purity and what's the revenue model is the question. Uh, purity depends dramatically on application. So in this case, let's define what we mean here. Uh, purity of what uh, when our robot is sorting different materials, at what purity is it actually sorting those materials? Some things are easier to see. Milk jugs, they're pretty similar to each other, right? Like you can see milk jugs pretty distinctly. Purity on milk jugs is 98% plus. Uh, if you talk about another uh, outbound product, mixed paper, which is just a lot of things, it has a, it's a big bell curve. Our purity on mixed paper depends a lot on how specific you want to be. And so not 98%, really more like 80% plus. Um, revenue model, there are several. So uh, our company uh, sells robots into existing facilities, uh, but we try to provide that on a variety of different CapEx to OpEx models uh, to those buyers because uh, recycling margins are kind of slim, so there's not a lot of cash in the hands of operators. Uh, there are a lot of great grant programs and uh, coalitions forming that help subsidize capital acquisition by these companies. So that's one. And in our facilities, we buy trash and we sort it and we sell it in the commodities market. So we're a commodities trader uh, for our uh, sorted material at our facilities. And just to add detail there, we you, you know we do sell wholesale complete sales. We sell robots as a service. We sell lease models. We have met our customers where we can with the right financial products as the company scaled. You know we we love to be a robots as a service company because you know that's what the the VC money really wants. But not every customer fits into that model. And you know over time we've been able to be flexible on it. Other questions, please. Uh, are network transport speeds a limiting reagent to how the system operates? Yeah, we're just repeating the question. Are network speeds a limiting action? Oh my God, yes. It's a nightmare. So this is this has literally been one of the things that we've sort of most fought on all of this. It, these mines and all are just using the internet to provide we are in the vast majority of cases using the internet they provide and dealing with whatever pipe they give us and trying to be good custodians of it. But like, you know, getting the 3 a.m. call from the customer, hey, I can't download a spreadsheet because your robot's tanking our entire network right now. We, we've we literally dealt with that. We've had that happen. Um, and, you know, we, we try to sort of deal with our customers on the contract level of say, hey, gave, give us an eight megabit a second connection. That's what we want. That's what will make our system happy and healthy. And about 5%, 10% of our customers actually meet that spec, but most of them, if we tell them we need eight, give us yep. half, <laughs> and that's still enough for us to get the data in and out. But you know, we'll, we'll deal with uh, pushing a software update to a system can take two weeks to actually stage the next software changes and uh, we, uh, egressing the data off the system. We egress what we can, when we can, from what systems we can. Another critical point to make is that the neural net is running on the edge, oh, so. Right. It, uh, we have a ruggedized compute cabinet that is, is holding a ruggedized computer with the GPU in there. And, and that's, I think, a really important thing. Going back to the earlier slide, 
that was not possible in 2014. It's very recent that you've been able to have edge deployable compute at the computational level necessary to run these algorithms. Um, because yeah, you know, we've had supercomputers for a long time, uh, but they, you know, they're in cooled buildings, uh, trash facilities don't have very good internet. So if you want to deploy this type of technology in the industry, you need sufficient edge compute. It also, for our own facilities then, uh, we have server rooms. We have rooms where 40 or 50 of these vision systems operating simultaneously and like the AC cooling on the server room starts to become fundamental infrastructure of the facility operating, which is just, it's kind of a cool new model. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah. Have you thought about a revenue model with the data? Oh, yes. Okay. Have we thought about a new revenue model for the data? Oh, always. Uh, one of the problems in this market is that nobody really knows uh, how much good stuff is in their bales or not. It's a very much uh, relationship-based model of you have given me good material before or you gave me a batch of bad material, we're going to show you off as a supplier. And that is a, a relatively inefficient low information market. And so there is definitely a race going on that we're trying to be at the head of that is be the provider of that federated information that the market trusts. Um, and that's, that's definitely like the data model, I would say. To even project sort of further out in the future, um, different municipalities, different governments around the world are starting to push towards a model of manufacturer responsibility and manufacturer accountability. And they're looking for solutions to enforce the quality of manufacturers' approaches to dealing with the recycling of their own material and looking for ways to audit that. And this is kind of a dream of where, where could AMP go? You know, we're identifying 100 materials today. A thousand materials in a few years, ten thousand materials a while after that. Eventually, we can say, "Hey, this is a Coke bottle from this manufacturer, from this plant," and we can actually start tracking all the way back to the manufacturer of like who gets the bill for the fact that this object ended up in this location. That's like such a dream. Yeah. Uh, may not be possible, but man, we'd love we're you know we'd love to build in that direction, and then we continue to do you know fundamental research to see where we can push this. Also, logistical note, we'll keep taking questions uh, because the room, there's not a talk right now, but if you do have to leave, it is 30 minutes after, we won't be offended. Um, I saw one over here earlier. Good question. It depends on how much headcount you have in neural net acceleration team, right? <laughs> so if you, you can, one, uh, I guess, stat to, to give you is like self-driving cars will run a model bigger than ours in two milliseconds per frame. Uh, and that's because they're staffed to do that. So we're trying to go down the path um, where either A, open up headroom on our existing compute so we can run heavier, better models, or B, be able to shrink our, our bomb by going down to stuff like Jetson. Right now, we don't fit on a Jetson at the speeds that we need. Um, we could if we did a, a simpler model, um, but for uh, where we are niched in the market, we like the model performance where we're at. But that's definitely one of the things that we'd like to move towards. To sort of state that from like the robotics application a little bit, we're selling a two hundred thousand dollars system ish. Like we're in that neighborhood of cost. Je justifying $5,000 in the compute, we put the compute that made sense for the system and then let the machine learning grow up to that ceiling instead of trying to save every dollar on it. And I think particularly when you look at a market like this where the AI is changing so quickly, the compute is changing so quickly, um, put as much compute as you possibly can into your application and then worry about the cost optimization down the line once everything's more understood. So we, we've gotten away with you know beefy, beefy computers. Um, um, another another massive advantage. This is just a random tangent. One to talk about is that you know the compute we have in the field matches the compute that our developers are developing on um, at their own computers, so they can run exact copies of the software on their own systems. We get massive development uh, advantages from them not having to cross compile to an embedded target for an optimized thing, or the, 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 you know their local development systems being massively different. That's more of an advantage than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah. So I'm curious, do you automatically build your data sets by tracking where human sorters put the trash or mm. manually Good question. Let's talk about the piper that must be paid. The question was, uh, do we uh, take advantage of watching human sorters uh, to auto-label our data versus annotating it ourselves? Uh, we have a roughly yeah, you know, it varies, but 
order of 100 offshore annotation team uh, that we manage to build our data sets. And so a big part of the AI group at AMP is managing the annotation because really modeling innovations, algorithmic innovations are half of it, but the other half is making the right data set. So let's build up a data set of these specific things we want to get better at, totally finding a needle in a haystack type problem, right? Like find me all of the batteries that passed under these cameras. We don't take advantage of like watching uh, uh, existing sorters. I actually would say if you wanted to, you'd have to have a camera that viewed them, which might be a little ethically weird. Uh, but even if you could, their accuracy is not actually that good. Um, and so one thing in AI is it's so mystical everybody's looking for like fully automated what's the silver bullet that makes this basically learn itself but you do kind of have to pay the piper at some point either you can have auto labeling techniques that require really expensive sensor base uh, and expensive cloud compute like it costs money or you can uh, manage like offshore and really the the answer is that it's both uh, that it's always going to be both so we're always looking for ways to reduce our you know dollar per Im annotated image uh kpi um, but we don't use the actual sorters for it one one point to add to that and you know rob earlier in the day in his talk talked about amp receiving non-dilutive funding early um it, it was Im is impossible to prove that you can build an ai that can do this without data so the very first customers, the very first locations where we were allowed to install a camera before anything worked were the incredible bootstrap that this startup needed to get off the ground. Um, and like there is nowhere where you could go and get a million frames of pictures of trash on conveyor belts. We had to figure out how to acquire that data in the first place. And, you know, like we, there, it's always luck in a startup. But the luck that we had to find good partners, particularly locally here in Colorado, that let us put experimental systems in their facilities that absolutely did not work, but let us capture the lessons that we needed to, to make the actual system work. Um, you treasure those people. Um, yeah. We were also lucky that JC and Rob uh, themselves annotated a whole bunch of, of frames over many hours when we didn't have any money to pay anybody else. <laughs> Late at night. Late at night. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to, to read back the, the first question, which I, I think I understood, um, are we using our system to then provide feedback to human sorters to improve human sorter performance? We do, uh, there's no crowdsourced annotation. We do a lot of quality review, uh, different processes. So there are a lot of kind of common tricks of the trade here. One is multi-pass annotation where you have multi, multiple annotators annotate the same thing. And then if they agree, then yay. If they don't, you send it to a, a reviewer that, that is uh, better schooled in it. Uh, well, I think one of the things that's hard in our application specifically, it's not that difficult. Um, of a robotics problem because everything is generally just moving in one dimension and we just go pick it up and put it away. Uh, it's a pretty hard computer vision problem because let's think back about that mixed paper example, everything looks the same. And so I show you a little bit blurry picture and I'm like, hey, gun to your head, is this polypropylene? <laughs> it's really hard. So we, we have to put a lot of time into training our annotation teams. Uh, and that is, it, it's more of an expensive annotation task because of the difficulty. Compare it to self-driving, gun to your head, is this a bicycle? <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet you could do that. You could crowdsource that. It's a little bit easier to do. So, um, but yeah, so lots of quality review. Yeah, to, to talk about it, you know, the neural network can only be as good as the quality of the data that you feed into it. And so, like, these annotators aren't Joe Schmo off the street. They are trained. They are trained extensively. The documentation provided to them, you know, if we can make our annotators 3% better at their accuracy and labeling the data, we can see that on the backside of the neural net super directly. So, um, a lot of, I think, people race to the bottom for the cost on the annotation. And, you know, tip of the trade. <laughs> Don't go too low on the cost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a question in the very back. Uh, you mentioned that you both operate facilities and tell the customer, which has the joyous challenge of channel construct. 
Ah, we are bypassing that right now because there's this interesting phenomena in the recycling market called secondary uh, sortation. Oh, so, repeat the question too, sorry. Oh, sorry, repeating the question. Uh, we have channel conflict. Um, we are both selling a tool to enable people to make money <laughs> And we are directly sorting recycling. Uh, it, it's a challenge, and you know it was a major risk to our business around messaging of that as we start to enter the, the recycling space that we're not threatening our main our main product line. Fortunately for us, we are not directly taking material from consumers. We're not getting your your trash directly. We are buying material from our existing customers that they sort to a certain grade, and then we can resort to a higher grade. We're also taking their residue material, their material that they've said we've extracted all the value we can out of that and we can still find 60 70 percent of that material is still valuable because their equipment just can't handle it um, there are a lot of recycling facilities around the country that you know imagine these are huge you know 30 40 50 million dollar facilities that take years to build populations move around the amount of recycling changes there was a massive increase in the amount of recycling that happened during the pandemic um, and then these facilities are overloaded when they're overloaded they recover less efficiently and then you know their their leftovers are a rich material stream where there's still value in it so um, so far that's how we've been able to avoid the rough channel conflict but it is you know a, a major concern of our business and how we continue to grow and a big point of stress well there are a couple other people who had them up too. Um, yeah, right here. Yeah, so on the business side of things, what is the limiting factor for Amp Robotics to grow? And then secondly, what is, what's next? Limiting factors to growth. I, I have to pick one. I think one limiting factor, uh, If and let's talk about the two businesses here. So if you're selling, what is the limiting factor to Amp's, Amp's growth? Um, if you're saving, selling heavy equipment, um, there's a liquidity problem. Uh, you have a lot of independent recyclers and then you have a few consolidated players like waste management and GFL. Uh, and a lot of those independent folks don't have the capital to justify in a really expensive sell. So you, you can penetrate into this market a little bit further faster than you, you think so that you actually are running out of TAM uh, maybe sooner than you would expect. Uh, there are also other competing technologies that um, are maybe more specific to different types of sortation, but uh, they are present a, a big uh, form of competition to us because the, the overhead robotic cell might not be the thing that wins. Um, how we think about that, though, I think the, the key to AMP's future growth in that arena is that we don't particularly care that it's an over, overhead Delta robotic cell. As Carter mentioned, that's not really the IP that's off the shelf. Our IP is that we have a system for rapidly uh, perceiving and executing on different waste streams. And so we are regularly productizing that into different form factor variants, different types of robots, so we can remain competitive with the particular market needs and with the available liquidity of people in the market. So lots of product pivoting uh, to uh, come up with solutions to industrial sortation problems that, that are emerging. On the other side, the other business of sorting, uh, do you want to take it? Yeah, oh, I just, I want to, I want to take it on a completely different track. Guys, scaling people in a company is incredibly difficult. Um, while we can scale software and copy and paste the software to actually achieve these systems in the real world, we have manufacturing facilities, we have buildings to run, we have parts to buy, stock inventory, we're now operating our own facility and are hiring literally hundreds of people to operate and execute on these facilities, like actually scaling at this point, we dream that we're a tech startup and we are a tech startup, but we're achieving that tech startup with real world hardware that has boats from China that sink um, and, and suppliers who literally just no, sorry, we don't sell that part anymore. Redesign your system around it. Um, so the, a lot of the scale comes down to the human factors of just being a company. Um, you know, We are not a uh, beautiful SaaS company that can just say, Google, give me 50 more customers. I need, I need 10 servers. Let's go. Um, that scale is always challenging. And I think um, all robotic startups have to, have to face it. I think the, the single thing I've said most thematically is you know, solve the least problems for yourself. We are succeeding at a lot of this by having incredible integration partners. Um, the, the people who are building large swaths of our system for us, the people who manufacture these robots that we've built strong partnerships with them and their engineering teams for when issues to come up. Um, uh, uh, cultivating your vendors um, in a robotics company is extremely important. 
two questions, but uh, first one, do you guys have any limitations by using generic hardware to do a... Could you define generic hardware? Like you're using uh, something that already exists in the industry. Uh, you haven't built your mm -hmm. robotic arm. Mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, so to repeat the question, are we suffering using generic hardware? Um, not yet, but what uh, we are struggling with is that we don't have as deep of a technological moat as a result of that. And what that, that means is that we were first to market, we have the largest market share, we've grown, but this system is not that difficult to then build a copy of. And there are now, I think, 12-ish other people who offer a similar system, all of which are lower performance than us, but then we have to continually invest in system performance to maintain that competitive edge, and they're buying the same parts from the same vendors we are a lot of the times, like the exact same robot arm that we're using they'll buy. Uh, that means that that product is harder to defend. On the flip side, we manage to get massive market penetration and huge amounts of revenue that can then fund R&D to do it the next round. So uh, I, would, I would just strongly encourage use off the shelf first and there's a finite life to that. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of economies of scale. How many total of these systems could be installed? Like what is the total addressable market and how much does that justify custom? Um, welcome to every debate I've ever had with our director of engineering. <laughs> it's no one has an answer to that and you have to try your best and and, and uh, make the make the wrong choices and then fix that later. And it's also a lot easier to innovate the hardware once you have revenue and millions and millions of dollars of investment. <laughs> so uh, off the shelf first helps for that. I, I did have a second one, probably a quick one. Is each arm, is it, are they all looking for everything using the same code mm -hmm. or are they specialized to specific material? Uh, question, are they specialized to specific material or do they all go after everything? They're actually all pretty generalized. So depending on what we're trying to do, it kind of comes down to, is the buyer specific enough that we have to have a premium amount of classification and therefore more specific? Uh, but generally, we actually do ship a global, uh, a global model. Uh, so they're all looking at everything, but not necessarily hi, picking everything. Hi, everyone. If you could t please take your seat. <laughs> Wait, can you hear me? No? Well, we might be done. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody.